Good morning, everybody, or good afternoon, make that, as we get into the second half of this Sunday. Hope everyone's having a great day and a great weekend. Today's date is Sunday, May 18th, 2014, and it's my pleasure to be with you this morning, and, or I should say again this afternoon, and discuss the markets from last week. All right, so number one, as we get into things here on In the Money Stock Market Action, I want to discuss what happened last week. I want you guys to be fully versed going into to next week. So what I first want to do is introduce my guest today. He's a guest that shows up often and we love having him here. He gives us such important insight. It's my business partner, Nicholas Santiago uh, from In The Money Stock Market, uh, Stocks.com. And again, he's joining us today. How are you doing today, Nick? I'm doing great, Gareth. It's great to be back. Thanks for having me again. Oh, it's our pleasure for sure. And again, we love the insight that you bring here and kind of your angle on cycles and all those things that really make up the market and and most people don't understand. And again, today's show, folks, special because we're going to be discussing some key factors that will make you money that the average investors just don't know. And we're going to talk a little bit about what Wall Street's trying to keep from you. And again, how do you know what to buy, what to sell, and when to do it? And it's funny because we were just discussing before we went on air some key tactics that alerted to a great trade on Friday morning pre-market. And we're talking about even before the market opened. W WWE was getting hammered by 50% in one single day off of some bad news. And this these signals, again, and I'm going to turn it over to Nick to just talk a little bit about it, but these signals really gave us the appropriate buy levels. And the stock literally, I think, bounced, what, $1.50 from $10 to yep. about 11 and a half or so? Well, I mean, it was an incredible bounce. Tremendous bounce. And uh, again, all you need to do is, is get educated and understand the markets. And you know, at, at InTheMoneyStocks.com, we now provide more tools than ever. We have a calculator there that virtually calculated the low of that stock. And if you can Amazing. combine it with other techniques that we use, you're going to create a good risk-reward setup for yourself to make money. Yeah, and just, just to get this into the into your, your ears this morning, guys, because I think it's that important. All right, so literally if you use this calculator on InTheMoneyStocks.com, which Nick put his proprietary factors into, it gave you the exact low pre-market of WWE when it was down over 50%. I mean, how did you know to buy it? I mean, when it was down 30 40 50% pre-market. Well, this calculator gave you that exact level. And ultimately, not only that, but if you know your max move calculations, it reinforced that level. And it was kind of one of those trades where I would say if you know what you're doing – with the in-the-money stocks techniques, you don't even have to worry about it. I mean, I don't I don't think you'd call it a stressful trade even. I mean, most people would look at it down 50% jumping in. It's a falling knife, they'd say. But it was, really wasn't, right, Nick? No, it wasn't. Um, you know, the, the only negative was that it happened pre-market. So if, if you're not a savvy trader and understand how to execute in the pre-market hours, uh, then you're a little bit out of luck. But, yeah, it, I mean, we love stocks like that. Oh, <laughs> if you yeah. give me something on sale at that price, I mean, we're going to jump on in 10, 10 out of 10. Absolutely. No, 100%, guys. And and again, we offer, just, just go to the website. You can actually play around with the calculator and type in some numbers. It won't give you the exact levels if you're not a member, but you can kind of see how to use it and how simple. Plus, we have tutorial videos on that as well. So I think it's important. You know, listen, we're giving you the tools to make money. It's just a matter, do you take up uh, that and run with it? Do you say, hey, listen, I want to be different than every other investor out there who just is kind of unsure about the market. Do I want to find the levels that are going to make me money every single day in this market. So I just wanted to start with that because I thought that was an awesome thing from last week, especially as soon as Friday. It came up as soon as Friday morning. And again, my name, Gareth Soloway, Chief Market Strategist here at InTheMoneyStocks.com. And I'm with my business partner, Chief Market Strategist, Nicholas Santiago. Now, let's go back to last week and discuss a little bit about the market. I mean, we saw the markets rally back on Friday. The S&P was up seven points, Dow up 44, NASDAQ up 21. But I thought last week was a really interesting week for a couple different reasons. Number one, Monday, we had a big rally. So Monday, we saw this gap up, and the markets kind of just floated up the rest of the day. Uh, we had a very <laughs> solid gain across the board. Tuesday, early, the rally continued, but then faded throughout the day. Wednesday, we saw a rollover late in the day, and Thursday, a big down day. So, I mean, net-net, all of a sudden, you had a big up day, followed by two kind of sideways-ish days, and then a drop day, almost negating the entire week. And then on Friday, we started out choppy and ended with a small buy program late in the day. Now, the one key here, and this is 
is going to be our next topic that I think is unbelievably important that most people probably don't grasp, interest rates. And specifically, we're talking about the 10-year yield. And if you looked at interest rates this week, it seemed like the market, as interest rates were collapsing, were really – we were seeing some selling on that. And I think I think you'd agree, right, Nick? I mean, if I don't know if you saw this on Friday, but I, I actually looked at the 10-year chart – and the yield itself, as the as the yield was inching down early, the markets kind of were selling. And then by the end of the day, we had this little pop in the 10-year yield, and the, the markets actually popped up right into the close. I mean, do you have any insight on that? Yeah, I, I do. Uh, right now, it looks like uh, – the well, the bond market, first off, is always smarter than the stock market mm -hmm. because the big banks really move money. That's what they do. The central banks, they're always trying to manipulate interest rates. Um, right now, with the yields falling the way they are, and I ultimately think that the yields are going to go a little bit lower mm -hmm. on the 10-year, believe it or not. Uh, the members know uh, at In The Money Stocks, we have a max move calculation that we've already worked out where we believe they're going to go down to. So there shouldn't be all that much downside, but there still should be more. But what's happening in the stock market, the stock market is saying, what does the bond market know that we don't know right now? Why are people flooding into treasuries right now? Why do people want to own bonds? And we're seeing yields collapse so, so low right now. And uh, the reason is is basically there's a lot of uncertainty out there. Uh, we, we have so much froth in this market. It's ridiculous between the amount of IPOs that we have out there, uh, the geopolitical events that are surrounding us. There, there's just so much out there. And you have a central bank that's just continuing to print money. I mean, look at food inflation. So the market's telling us, hey – there's something wrong here. Something is this. This can't go on like this. Hmm. And I think the stock market is starting to say, "Whoa, uh, yields Problems. going down. This this could mean headaches." So yeah, and, and I think what Nick said is so important here to understand is that you know if if you talk to the average person on the street and you say, "Hey, you know, are you putting a hundred million or or a hundred billion in bonds?" They're going to be like, "Obviously no." But that's where the big money can put their money, and that's what they're doing. I mean, remember, if you got a hundred billion dollars and you're making, I don't know, a couple percentage points on it, you're making some good money there. So the big money stores their money in the bond market, and that's why you have to refer to it and understand that it's kind of a leading signal, okay? And I think you'd agree, right? I mean, that's that's where it is. Absolutely. The bond market is smarter than the stock market. That's, that's really what it comes down to. It always has been that way, and in my opinion, it always will be. Right. So so what you have to take from that is that if, if yields are falling, if interest rates are falling, and that's counterintuitive, remember, because the Federal Reserve supposedly is pulling back on the printing of money. They've pulled $10 billion off now every single meeting that they've been meeting. And so it, you know, everyone would have said six months ago, oh, I'm sure interest rates are going to go higher, 3%, 3.5% as they withdraw their stimulus, because that's what they were doing. As they were flooding the market with money, they were purposely deflating interest rates to try to stimulate the housing market and all these other things. Uh, so in theory, when they pull out, you would think that interest rates would go up. So the, so the key here is that the fact they're not going up should be a warning shot across the bow of this market, that something is not as rosy as you might have hoped. And I think I think you have to look at just you know economics, right? I mean, just look at the economy. Uh, do you think we have great growth out there? Well, in the first quarter, GDP, what, 0.1%, one-tenth of 1%? One tenth of one percent I mean, is it, not very good. Yeah, I mean, you blame it on the weather. You say, "All right, eh, snowstorm, snowstorm, snowstorm." But I mean, ultimately, you know, how much better do we think the second quarter is going to be? Maybe half a percent, one percent. I mean, that's not growth, folks. That is barely treading water at this point. And the bond market's starting to tell us all that that's correct. All right. And again, I, I think I don't know if you have anything else on that, but I think it's important for everyone to know that when interest rates go down, they're thinking, I mean, that's people running for safety because they don't want to be exposed to the global economy or the or the uh, domestic economy. Well, I, I think you hit the nail on the head uh, when you talk about the global economy, because a lot of people are not talking about Japan. And Japan is where really, in my opinion, where the fireworks are going to begin. Uh, this yen carry trade, which we talked about a couple of weeks ago on this show. Uh, and I explained to you how the liquidity for stocks is is virtually created through this yen carry trade. The big money, in essence, uh, they're right now shorting the Japanese yen. And when the Japanese yen strengthens, there's no more money to buy uh, S&P 500 future contracts. And that causes the market to go down. Uh, we've isolated that yen carry trade. We talked about it uh, going back to December 2012. You're not going to hear this on CNBC. Maybe now they're going to catch on because we're so long in the tooth here with this trade. But uh, this is what it's all about. And um, there's a lot of interesting dynamics that are taking place. And I think traders better be prepared. Investors better be prepared. Just mom and pop at home that are listening to the show better be prepared for the second half. Uh, this is not going to be a pretty picture.
Absolutely. So I think that's important, folks, as we kind of get into, um, you know, the the first portion of the segment here and head towards our first commercial break. I think it's important to understand that the markets are barely treading water. And you have to understand that right now with the markets trading near their all time highs, I mean, most average investors are going to say, and maybe even some of you listening are going to say, hey, listen, you know, this market is near its all time highs. But if you look at the individual signals, for instance, the NASDAQ, NASDAQ's well off its highs. The biotech sectors collapse down. If you look at social media stocks, some of them are down 40 or 50%. I mean, these are massive drops to the downside, and that's the beginning. I always look at it like the dam breaking or starting to see little little cracks in it, right? And what about the Russell 2000, oh. which represents small companies in America? I mean, the Russell 2000 has just been absolutely annihilated, uh, but the public, and that's, believe it or not, you, the, the listener, the public is going to follow the Dow Jones Industrial Average. Come uh, at nighttime when people get home from work and they turn on the 6 o'clock news, Oh, the Dow is up five points. Oh, the Dow is up 50 points. The real meat and potatoes of the stock market is in the NASDAQ and the Russell 2000 because that's where people go for growth. Right. Yeah, exactly. So, I mean, if you're looking for growth in the economy and you want to see if there is growth, look at interest rates, look at the Russell and look at the NASDAQ, and that will tell you everything you need to know. And if you scan those charts right now, folks, it's not a pretty picture. And that's, again, I'm not saying that tomorrow we're going to have epi an epic collapse. What we're saying is that down the line, it's a warning signal. It's saying that it's coming, just like in 2007. Wouldn't it have been great? I mean, Nick and I were telling everyone, but we didn't have, you know, not everyone listened to us. But, I mean, you know, wouldn't it have been nice to know ahead of time before the epic collapse that began in late 2007 that you were going to drop 50-plus percent on the market? So that would have been nice. And the nice part about it was we made money. Absolutely. While the rest of the country was uh, losing their job. Yeah, and not to say that we didn't try to tell everyone, hey, listen, we got out in every media media outlet we could, and we saw, talked about it. But again, well, we're no CNBC at that stage, especially, and, and that's that's the bottom line. you got to be ready to listen. As an individual investor, you have to be around and be ready to focus on the internals of the market, the real internals, not what's being spewed out by the financial media. So listen, we're going to take a quick break here. Uh, but again, thank you all for joining us on this Sunday. And again, my name is Gareth Soloway, Chief Market Strategist at In The Money stocks.com i'm joined today by chief market strategist nicholas santiago from in the money stocks.com and this is in the money stock market action on 8 20 a.m news talk radio welcome back everybody great to be with you again here on this sunday hopefully you all are enjoying the beautiful weather this weekend it's truly been a great day in the tampa bay area now what we want to do here on in the money stock market action in this next segment is discuss a little bit about something that i see very concerning about global geopolitical issues arising and i've talked to you guys for quite a while on this show about what's going on between russia and ukraine and the violence and you know russia taking over the crimea area and so forth but i think it's kind of interesting to note that there are more issues popping up around the globe just like this. For instance, you know, recently, I think over the last week or so, we saw China move an oil rig into a disputed portion of, of seas right off of Vietnam. And there are now huge protests and, and violent protests in Vietnam over this action because it's like China's starting to encroach, encroach on this area. And I think even with some of the other parts with Taiwan, there's a lot of disputed lands in that part of the world. And you have to be concerned concerned just as anyone who knows history about world wars and other things that these type of events are starting to crop up and i have to turn it over to nick i want to just talk a little bit about war cycles and i mean do we have a chance for something like this to kind of erupt into a bigger scale uh, issue absolutely absolutely we're we're in the midst of a war cycle right now so and i mean we've already seen it happen in russia with with uh uh the violence in in the ukraine and uh we're probably starting to see it uh, develop in, in China with Vietnam and uh, also with Taiwan involved. And don't forget, China and Japan have been bickering back and forth over a, a, a set of islands uh, in one of the seas over there. So uh, th there's definitely, uh, we're starting to see more and more, and you will see more of this throughout 2014, without a doubt. Yeah, and I think it's it's one of those things where, you know, you might say, oh, we're in America, who cares what happens around the globe? And, and I mean, I think in this global economy, we don't have that luxury anymore. I think if you go back 100 years, you know, 200 years, it was more like that. You know, two countries want to deal with their issues, you let them deal with it. Uh, obviously not in a situation like World War II, but in this day and age, I, we all have to recognize that our economic success 
comes from global issues. I mean, we have so much trade with China, with Japan, with Europe, with, with even to some extent Russia and things getting filtered through there that you can't just say, oh, well, who cares what happens over there? Because ultimately it will affect our economy. Now, the question is, again, does this cycle start to play out in terms of a bigger conflict? And that's something that you know both Nick and I as, as chief market strategists, we have to be on the cutting edge of. Because remember, there's money to be made in the markets. If some big event starts to come through, guess what? Markets are going to dive. We need to know that ahead of time and be short the markets, make money to the downside, and vice versa. If things are going to get better, then we have to know to be on the long side. So keep in mind that it's a global economy, and if you know how to read charts and read the cycles, you can understand it coming and profit immensely from it. All right, and again, I think that's such an important factor. And again, watch in the coming weeks what happens in the news and does it start to get a little bit worse? Because I know over this last week, I even read something about China. There's like a, a, a reef, little kind of reef bubbling out of the ocean somewhere, and, and they're building like a, a strip, like an aircraft kind of strip right there. And, and it seems like China is now almost taking a cue. I know China just recently signed a, a gas agreement with Russia too, yeah, right? They did. They did sign a gas agreement, and, and it's a big one. It's, it's not a, a small agreement. They've, they've really joined, almost joined hands together mm -hmm. with this agreement do you think do you think that there's a situation where they see i mean china sees what russia's doing and how basically the rest of the world just let them take over crimea and they're saying hey listen you know we could expand our our borders just a little bit here sure i i think every nation um especially uh, develop, as, as as they've grown china has just grown tremendously over the past 20 years um they start to feel their oats and and you know hey i could i could do this i could do that and, um, you know, it, I think it's just a, a natural occurrence that everybody's going to flex their muscles a little bit. Mm -hmm. And Russia's always done it. Uh, and then if you take a look at uh, China, they have a, a real score to settle with, with, with Japan, and Japan's a major ally of the United States. Where it really gets interesting is that China depends so much on the United States. We buy and consume all of the goods that they make. Um, and they buy a lot of U.S. Treasury bonds. Mm -hmm. So, it, you know, there's a marriage there, even though it, it's not the, the greatest of marriages. It may be on rocky ground, but both countries rely on each other. And it's really where it's going to get really interesting. Yeah, I think, I think that's such a, it is really an interesting aspect because it's like, you know, how bad can relations get when you have that much riding on each country? I mean, you might say, well, who cares, you know, about China? But to be honest, if if they decided to dump their their debt that they bought for, of of our, well, our debt that they bought on the open market, I mean, they'd crash us, right? Uh, I don't know. I mean, I would have to think. You know, it's 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 over a trillion dollars. So, I mean, you have to think that uh, if they dump U.S. Treasuries on the open market, I don't really don't know what you know how it would be, but. Uh. You know, we probably well, we probably unfortunately we probably know what would happen. Well, in this case, it might be a good thing, but you'd probably have the Fed just coming in and printing another trillion. Well, to that's, take it that's off. what they <laughs> they seem to do anyway. But uh, the funny thing is, we were talking about uh, the bond market just just in the last segment, and you know maybe money's rushing into the Treasury market simply because of all of these uh, conflicts that are, are 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 starting. And you know we're just. Yeah, the market the market is so efficient. It is always ahead of the curve. Mm -hmm. And that's why we want to read charts. How many times have we read a chart and we never knew the story and all of a sudden the story's out and we we have already profited and said, Wow, that was that was why that happened. That, that was why that chart formation formed. Charts Absolutely. always ahead of, of the uh, of the news story. Yeah, a good example of that was on uh, on Tuesday. So Monday we had that big rally in the markets where we gapped up and kind of floated up the rest of the day. And on Tuesday early in the morning, you had this little uptick in the S and P 500 where we shot up initially, and then the markets faded and kept on hammering on this key trend line. And I talked about it to our members, and I said, "Listen, you know, we keep on hammering on this trend line. The more you hammer on a trend line, it's kind of like a, a door. The more you hit a door with your shoulder running into it full force, the weaker it becomes." And I said, "If we break through this, I mean, you're." going to see some downside later this week and and we talked about that i think even even last week on the radio it's potentially seeing some downside kind of by the end of options x week and sure enough the markets broke through that door and we saw that drop down on late wednesday and into thursday before a little bit of a recovery on friday so you know the charts really do tell the future and we're able to position ourselves uh very lucratively in front of that move now Going here into into the next minute or so, Nick. I mean, what are we seeing? I was looking at the Nasdaq and the and the IWM, uh, the Russell. I mean, if you look at the Nasdaq, is there is there kind of a bearish chart set up on there? It, it's as bearish as I could as I've seen in a long, long time. The daily chart is not so terrible. When you take a look at the weekly chart, I mean, that's setting up to trade down right now. The Nasdaq Composite, I believe, closed at 
4,090. Um, this chart setup is telling me the NASDAQ wants to go down and test 3,800. That's a significant drop coming uh, for the NASDAQ. Do you have Do you have on your uh, QQQ chart, which is the NASDAQ 100, do you have like a, a kind of a head and shoulders there that potentially could fall if we fell down, for instance, and took out the 200 uh, right around there? I mean, is that is that something you're seeing there? Yeah, I mean, I, I ultimately think there's very little upside in the QQQ chart, probably only to $89. Ultimate downside to the QQQ Q chart, the uh, triple Qs, I should say, is around uh, $80. So wow. we have, that's, that's a big fall. Anybody that's traded the uh, power shares, triple Qs, which is the NASDAQ 100, should know if you fall seven, eight dollars that's a tremendous, tremendous move. That's a 10% move right there from our current levels, guys. So, I mean, you're talking about a 10% drop, and we're not even at the highs on the Qs right now, uh, still a few dollars away from that. So that would be a mammoth drop on the charts. So, I mean, it just it just kind of puts us in this position where, you know, as, a, as an investor, I think, and this is something I always try to convey to our, our, our subscribers at InTheMoneyStocks.com. And by the way, there's a seven-day free trial to the Research Center, which is geared towards investors. And even newbies, you get in there, you're going to slowly kind of grasp the methodology and we'll kind of walk you, handhold you uh, through things. But a seven-day free trial to that uh, research center, which we strongly encourage you trying out. Um, but you know, if you look at the issues out there, whether it's the geopolitical possible kind of incursions uh, with China and Vietnam and Taiwan and Japan and all these different scenarios there, the Russian-Ukrainian issue, then you look at the bond yields falling. And I mean, it's almost like laying cheese down for a mouse and just following, following those steps along. And I want you guys to make sure that you're not aloof on the next big drop. Okay, and I think that's the key is that, you know, if you look back to the previous collapses, whether it was the tech bubble in, in 2000 collapsing or in 2007, the top being put in right there. I mean, if you could have seen that, literally hedge fund managers made their careers by calling that. I mean, they, they made billions and billions of dollars. So please understand going forward, read the charts, understand how to see and predict these. And that's what Nick and I are here for. Okay, we're here for you. We're here to going to teach you guys how to do that. So my name again, Gareth Soloway, Chief Market Strategist at InTheMoneyStocks.com. This is Nicholas Santiago, Chief Market Strategist at InTheMoneyStocks.com. And this is In The Money Stock Market Action on 820 AM News Talk Radio. Now back to In The Money Stock Market Action on AM820 News. Here's Gareth Soloway. Welcome back, everybody. Great to be with you again on this uh, Sunday, May 18th, 2014. My name, Gareth Soloway. I'm joined by Chief Market Strategist Nicholas Santiago. Together, we rock uh, in the moneystocks.com, helping members from across the world, literally from Australia to China to Singapore to the US and even down into South Africa we have members that have come to us and we've literally changed their lives I mean it's funny Nick because I you know I just kind of remember some of these comments people have made from all over the world about how how now they're able to put their kids through college how now they're able to you know afford to take that next vacation and it's it's the beauty of it I think you'd agree is that we're not just really giving them the fish you know they always say you know give a man a fish feed him for a day you know teach a man to fish teach him, feed, feed him for life and we've really Really done that and I think that's something that everyone listening should understand right absolutely I think that's why our company has actually grown exponentially uh, since its inception uh, we've we've actually not only have helped people or given them but we've we've taught them how they can do it on their own and how they could pass this knowledge down to their children and um, you know e even look at what we've done in our own lives and you can see even how, as we timed the real estate market and bought our own properties I mean these are just beneficial things and that that you can always use throughout the rest of your life you don't have to be a victim of a recession or even a depression you can actually always uh, know exactly the next step that the economy is going to make and you can profit from it or at least protect yourself uh, when it does happen yeah I think that's such a key point is understanding that reading a stock chart Everything's a chart. Everything in your life is a chart. You know, you want to be the next person to know when the real estate is topping or bottoming. Just read it the same way. I mean, if you want to know how to do any commodities, currencies, I mean, everything that you can do or buy or sell, that is enabled by the methodology here that we teach and you know again it changes people's lives and and you know just like you know you go you go to a brokerage firm and you have a broker calling you on a phone pitching a stock I mean they're just pitching you a stock here we're teaching you how to go find your stocks which is more important because this way you don't have an, an agenda other than taking care of yourself and I think you know Nick you'd agree that you know when you're dealing with brokerages and and Goldman Sachs type I mean there's always some sort of agenda in fact we saw Goldman getting fined and a bunch of these companies getting fined for for pushing investors into into you know, 
kind of derivatives and different things that they knew were not going to survive the collapse, but they just wanted to dump them off and unload them, right? Sure. I mean, you know, just look at the uh, whole uh, John Paulson scandal with Goldman Sachs. I mean, you could just go on and on. I mean, 2010, they had probably the, the, the worst reputation out there. Um, they're trying to clean up their act a little bit, but it's just the cost of doing business for these big firms. We, we, we look at the charts. I honestly don't care what a company does. I don't care if it makes widgets or if it uh, cures cancer. Um, what does the chart tell me to do? Should I own it? Should I leave it alone? Or should I sell it short? I'm going to try to make money on it some way, somehow, as long as the chart tells me there's an opportunity there. Yeah, and it's so it's so important to understand that, folks. And as we teach you this methodology at InTheMoneyStocks.com, whether you take our webinars, or whether you're a member to the Research Center or in the Intraday Stock Chat, I mean, it's all about giving you and enlightening you to that point where you can make the decision on your own. You don't have someone else saying, oh, hey, listen, you know, buy this or sell this or, oh, the next hot stock tip. That's nonsense. You hear that, run from it. All right, what you need to do is you need to just simply be able to look at the chart. And Nick and I will tell you this. I mean, literally, you show me a chart, within about three seconds, I can make a determination whether it's a buy, a sell, or a neutral. And that's what you get to to the point where now everything in your life, you know, okay, do I want to buy a car? Let's, let's, let's analyze it just like a chart. Do I want to buy this beach house that I bought a couple years ago? Okay, well, let's analyze it like a chart. And, you know, speaking of that beach house, bought it. Paid a minimal amount. It's already made one hundred and fifty plus thousand dollars in in return on what I could sell it for now because I was able to read that chart. And Nick did the same thing, absolutely the same thing, right? Yeah, I mean, when I I bought my home, it, it's it's over doubled in price and value from where, where I bought it in two thousand eleven. I bought Amazing. it in, uh, the week after Thanksgiving two thousand eleven. People were laughing at me. You know, 3.9% interest rate. On it. And uh, I mean, not that I need it, but you, you do have to have a mortgage for tax purposes in this world. Uh, but yeah, I mean, we timed it. And that, that's and, and the best part was people laughed at me when I sold my house. Now that house is gone uh, due to Hurricane Sandy, but I, I sold it at the peak in the market. Yeah, that's and, amazing to me, man. And I think that's so cool Like to, to be able to time it like you were saying to me. I mean, even even when you were in New York, and, and we're both from New York, I mean, um, but, to, but to use that to your advantage in everyday life by like buying that property and then, and then knowing, listen, I, I've, I've had my good run here. Don't get greedy. Just, just kind of step aside. Yeah, real, real quick, uh, what, what everybody wants to remember, when everybody is euphoric, you don't want to be euphoric. You want to you want to be selling into that, and when everybody is in despair, that's when you want to start to be a buyer. Mm -hmm. And if you have that mentality throughout life, and we were talking about this earlier, you know, just being a contrarian in everything that we do, and um, you know, this is something that we teach you to do. And and if you really learn it, you're you're going to profit in other areas of your life. You'll profit in buying a business at the right time. You'll profit in buying a home at the right time. Everything in our lives is really a business. I mean, Absolutely. you know, this is America. This is this is what this country is all about. It's it's about business. It's not about you know coming here. I mean, you get an immigrant that comes here in ten years, they're usually a millionaire because they see the streets paved with gold here. Um, unlike if you live in a, another country with a dictator, uh, you know, you may not have a chance to to really elevate your lifestyle. Here, you have all the opportunities in the world, and if you learn how to read the charts. There's really nothing that can stop you. Yeah, absolutely. And, and just again, guys, you know, we'll teach you how to do it all. It doesn't, honestly, you give me someone brand new. I mean, like, imagine, I think Nick would agree with this, is, is we can teach anyone how to read the charts. The people that will be the best at it will be people that have no prior market experience because they don't have any bad habits. And, you know, you, t you give me someone who's been a broker for 50 years who, you know, has, has it ingrained in their mind, that broker mentality, they're going to be the hardest for me to teach. You show me someone who has never traded a stock in their life, and I can teach them in a short amount of time, right? Absolutely. You want somebody that has – that have they have no preconceived notions. And if you come in with just an open mind and you learn the charts right off the bat – you're going to be a star. I mean, yeah. you you honestly will be a star in this business. We've we've trained farmers and sanitation workers uh, that are that are financially independent now in, in just a couple of years, and and we have people that have you know economics degrees that just can't really grasp it because they're still listening to all the noise that's out there. They want to know the the CPI and the PPI and yep. earnings per share and book value and PE ratios and. All that other nonsense. Yeah, I still remember in college, you know, when I was back in college, I took an economics course and, and you know, someone asked me recently, you know, all right, so you took e economics 101 and, you know, upper levels and I majored in economics and I was asked, well, you know, how much, how much of that do you really use today? I mean, do you use a lot of it in what you do? Honestly, pretty much none. 
I mean, I think there's a couple concepts like supply and demand that are basic concepts that you probably use. But aside from that, I mean, this is this is a different world, and it's a world where didn't they just say some? What was that? Who was the one of these hedge fund managers made like three billion dollars last year? I mean, you know, you think sports stars make a lot of money? Not even close, guys. No, not even close. <laughs> not even. David Tapper made three point five million. You know, and, billion. Billion. Excuse yeah. me. Billion. And you know, basically, he owned the spiders. Really, what, what did you know? What did he? What did he really own? You know, but he's got a reputation and he's able to raise a lot of capital. Absolutely. You know, and that's, that's what it comes down to. Now, do you think, Nick, um, I mean, we're talking about interest rates earlier, which have collapsed down to the, about the 2.5 area. And obviously, it's having a big influence on the market. And, and as interest rates are dropping, it's actually been a negative, which I can't think is a change from in the past. You know, we always wanted to see interest rates low because then housing would recover. But as interest rates have fallen and people's views on the economy have kind of soured, I mean, should we've, we've seen housing numbers kind of get a little weak here. As interest rates drop, do you think housing will start to inch back up a little bit? No. I, mean, no, huh? <laughs> I don't because uh, really it, it's, this whole market is predicated on the banks, right? All these bailouts that took place. TARP and everything else, it, it you know even even the low interest rates that the Federal Reserve is setting now, the banks four banks get free money: J.P. Morgan, Wells Fargo, Citigroup. So the yield curve is now flattened, and and um, you know can these banks continue to make money if we don't give them free money? I mean, basically, mm-hmm. the Federal Reserve just keeps printing money and allows them to have an overnight lending rate of zero. So they could borrow all that they want, and they could charge you on 18, 20 percent on your credit card or more. Uh, they'll make loans that are very, very secure for them if they want to. Um, but that's really what it comes down to. It just comes down to saving the big banks that are too big to fail. That has never been solved. It never will be solved, and it'll it, the crisis will happen again. Yeah, it's it's interesting because it just brings up that whole idea of too big to fail. Is uh, you know there was such an uproar over that in two thousand and nine and so forth. But notice how it's just faded off. I mean, when was the last time you were watching a broadcast and someone brought up like too big to fail and was kind of angry about it and why why are these banks too big to fail? Let's split them up. And notice how all the money from these lobbyists has gone to the right politicians and everything's just all of a sudden just slowly fading from memory. And I mean that's what's what's crazy to me is that. The too big to bank, the too big to fail issue is still a major issue. And if it's going to still be a major issue, at least give us a huge surging economy. But we don't even have that now. No. I mean, it's it's like you barely have an economy now. The banks are still too big to fail. Now, what if something goes wrong again? They're too bigger to fail. That's right. <laughs> They've even you know just remember, J.P. Morgan took over Bear Stearns. They took over Wachovia. Bank of America took Countrywide over. Uh, you know, all of these guys just got just they're just gigantic now. Oh. So whatever happened to those toxic derivatives, whatever happened to that, they just buried it under with all that printed cash. And the Federal Reserve is in a real pickle here because I just don't know how they're ever going to unwind $4 trillion on their balance sheet. So, yeah, there's there's no inflation is what they tell you because there's $4 trillion just stuck on their balance sheet. Once they release that and they put that, that into the open market, you're going to see inflation like you've never seen before. I just don't know how they could ever unwind. Do you this. think? I mean, do you think they ever will? I mean, you know, just a side note here, just something it just jogged my memory. But uh, I think there was someone who paid like a hundred plus thousand dollars to have a dinner with Bernanke, and the one headline I saw from this was that, and I, I don't again. Don't quote me on this because I, it, literally I saw it in a fleeting moment, but something that Bernanke said at that dinner was reported, and he said that he did not feel that that interest rates would ever normalize in his lifetime. I and he's that. 60 degrees, uh, sixty <laughs> age 60. He's, he's yeah. 60 years old. Yeah, So and, and I think that was with David Einhorn, hedge fund manager mm-hmm. David Einhorn, who came out to the public and to his credit said that he didn't really feel good about that meeting with Bernanke, that dinner. He said, I, sh- I got no confidence leaving that, that dinner. And, uh, you know, and he's looking for a bubble as well. So, yeah, I mean, this is problematic. I mean, this is just not normal. Capitalism is supposed to work properly, and and we have crony capitalism out here. So, in other words, and I understand why they did it. You know, they want to keep the system intact, and you don't want people on on a bread line. But the way capitalism is supposed to work is if you fail, you fail. You go out of business, and then we rebuild all over again. And you rebuild better, right? You rebuild better. better. Yeah, you rebuild better, and and you don't make the same mistakes. Well, you know, we've been partying like it's 1999 for 50 years now, and uh, something's something's going to come home to roost here. And and we're you know the next two, three, four years are going to be just um, if you know what you're doing, there's tremendous opportunities. If you don't know what you're doing, you could be in a world of pain. Hmm. Do you so do you think that down the line? I mean, you know, we we've talked to great great people like G. Edward Griffin and. Um, 
you know, some of these other amazing Jim authors, Rogers. Jim Rogers and stuff like that. Even on this air, we talked to those guys and, and brought those interviews to you guys out there listening. But do you think, I mean, a lot of their comments are that we need to do away with the Fed. I mean, do you actually, do you think that at some point that $4 trillion is just going to be, I mean, is there any way for us to just, I mean, could the Fed go bankrupt and just, you know, kind of remove themselves from that? I don't think they'll ever go bankrupt because they could just print money. I mean, what what could happen, two, two scenarios, it could be like Zimbabwe's central bank who printed all this money and, you know, now it takes a million dollars dollars, millions of Zimbabwe dollars to buy a loaf of bread. I mean, or you could have something like what happened in the Weimar Republic in, in Germany where, you know, people were just taking their money to heat up their house. They were burning it. Um, hopefully we never experienced that. But here's what I think is the solution. All right. So we're going to be on a fiat system here. Why not have 10 Federal Reserves? Why not have all these guys competing against each other? Mm. I think that's the competition. Right now, the Fed is a monopoly. The Federal Reserve Bank is a monopoly. There is nobody to compete against. They set interest. A professor, college professor who's not a trader, not an investor, he just sets interest rates, what he believes is so-called the right rate. So we know the Ben Bernanke experiment when he wrote his college thesis was if we flood the money, flood the market with money, things will, people will feel better. The markets will get better. Things will, will come back. Well, to some degree, he's been right, but we flooded it with $4 trillion. How do you ever take that $4 trillion off the books? I don't think you can. So that's where the real problem lies. Do you think, do you think Bernanke, ha- when, he, when he was doing this money printing, that he had an exit strategy? Or do you think he had an exit strategy and he just had to keep flooding it and that exit <clears throat> strategy went out the window at that point? His ex- exit strategy is hope. What he's doing is he flooded the market with liquidity. He had other central banks flood the market with liquidity as well. So there's just massive money supply hitting the system. Money has to go somewhere. It goes into stocks, and we've had asset inflation, right? Every stock is, you know, take a stock like uh, Pure One Imports. It went from a dollar to, I don't even know where it is today, 20-something dollars. Oh, even, I think I, I still remember, and I kick myself for not buying it back then, but I think it was down to like 15 cents. Yeah, it might have been. Yeah, it was almost, uh, you know, virtually a penny like dollar, stock. Dollar, the, the dollar general or whatever, whatever car company, too. I still remember that, right. like below a dollar, and it went to like 60 bucks or 70 right, budget bucks. Budget or thrifty, but one yeah. of those, you oh, know. Man. I mean, it, just think about the asset inflation that we have in this system right now. So um, his theory was if I flood the market, we'll eventually get growth. And if there's growth then growth will take care of itself. The problem is the growth has been so anemic. So anemic. Mm-hmm. It's been so small. That's really what the problem is. Now, the bigger problem lies every time you have a bull run like this, five years, six years, seven years. Now, we've been five years into this one. You're going to hit another recession. Yeah. It's inevitable. It always happens. How can we handle the next recession if we weren't allowed to even have a recession? Do you think like I mean the Fed Fed is obviously um, pulling liquidity out. They're not printing as much. I mean they're still printing, so it's they're not pulling it out yet, but they're lowering the amount that they're printing. They're tapering. You, yeah, they're tapering. So do you think that that's a uh, do you think they are coming to the realization that it's not helping anymore and that's why they're doing Because, I mean, you can't look at the economy and say, oh, we are great, great growth. So why are they changing course now? If that's truly what they believe, that printing money will eventually lead to great growth, are they now admitting defeat? They just don't want to tell the public? Well, let's first start off with this. They've never been right. Right. That's They've, true. They, they have a history of having the worst track record in the history of when it – I mean, just look back in, in 2002 when they created the great housing boom and the, and, and the credit bubble. I mean, Alan Greenspan lowered uh, interest rates to 1% on the Fed funds rate. Now, just so that everybody understands what the Fed funds rate is, it's not what you and I pay. We pay the prime. Okay, that's a different rate. The banks pay the discount window. The Fed funds rate is for the four large banks. They pay right now zero. Back in 2002, he lowered that to 1%. By the time he raised that up to 5%, the market couldn't even handle it. And we started to to just crater. So, um, you know... I just don't know how they're ever really going to going to be able to raise interest rates. But more importantly, if if deflation takes hold, um, it, it's going to be it's going to be a nasty disaster in about three four years. La- last question before we take a, a break here: um, Do you think that the lack of growth and inflation will come down the pipe, leading to stagflation? I mean, is that an option in the next, let's say, three years? Do you think that could happen? I think that's or we're already we're already there. Yeah, yeah. I think you know we we're, we're in stagflation now. Just look at the GDP number. I mean this, yeah, you could get an iPod much cheaper, but 
food and I, food and energy are going to be much more expensive. So I think we've already we're already in stagflation. Oh. And just so everyone knows, and we're going to take a break in a second here, but stagflation is where you have inflation but no growth. Usually, when inflation occurs, it comes with growth. But the worst case is to have inflation with no growth because it means people aren't making money to compensate for higher prices. And I guess, yeah, you could look out there and see that absolutely these days. All right. My name, guys, Gareth Soloway, Chief Market Strategist here at InTheMoneyStocks.com. And I'm with Chief Market Strategist Nicholas Santiago at InTheMoneyStocks.com. We're going to take a quick break here. Uh, and this is In The Money Stock Market Action on 820 AM News Talk Radio. Welcome back, everybody. Again, great to be with you on this Sunday, May 18th, 2014. As we wrap up the show today, folks, in the next 10 minutes or so, I want to just discuss, we're obviously going to give you some trade setups going forward. But before we do that, let's talk a little bit about Alibaba, the biggest IPO of all time. Uh, Nick, what are you thinking about this IPO that's coming down the pipeline here? What does it tell us about the market? Well, when we see IPOs like this, especially of, of this size, I think this is the largest IPO ever uh, in the United States. So uh, when you see an IPO like this, you, you got to be a little bit concerned. There's been so many IPOs hitting the market in 2014. Uh, when I see this, I, I think it's, it's reminiscent of a top, and uh, I think traders really should be concerned. Um, this is just a huge, massive IPO. It's bigger than Facebook. It's going to be bigger than Visa, bigger than General Motors. I, I think it's the, it, it is the biggest ever. Mm -hmm. uh, it's going to be over, they're going to raise over $20 billion. Um, I, I think within the next 30 days after this IPO, I think people, traders, investors, you have to be concerned. Yeah, I think it's interesting to note here, too, there's so much hype around Alibaba, too. I mean, every day on CNBC, it's being mentioned every day on Bloomberg. And, and that has to be a signal to us as, as average investors. If you're listening and you're hearing this, you're probably thinking, oh, maybe I should buy some Alibaba shares. I'm telling you right now, it's better to sit on the sidelines because by the time you get into it, all the insiders will have bought much, much lower, and you're probably going to run into a situation. I wouldn't be surprised. Remember the, the hype around Facebook, and Facebook opened up and then just literally dived almost 50% over the next few months? I wouldn't be surprised if that situation happens. And a couple things concern me about the Alibaba IPO. Obviously, the hype is one thing, and as an average investor, never buy into hype. But the big thing here is to understand that Alibaba is basically like the Amazon of, of China. And you know, Amazon here has a large market share already, right? I mean, on, online, they're probably, I don't know, 75% of everything online is on Amazon. Uh, Alibaba in China has a bigger share of that that region. For instance, I think they're up to like 85 or 90 percent of the total buys online go through Alibaba in China. And why is that concerning? I mean, many people would say, oh, well, that means it's a great investment because they, they've monopolized it. Well, the problem is people want to buy growth, right? I mean, if, are you going to buy a company that's just going to make the same amount of money every single year? Not really. That's not a good investment. You want growth. And the question is, how is Alibaba going to grow if they already have that big of a market share? Like, for instance, Amazon, three years ago, five years ago. Think about the growth that they've experienced. Okay, that's growth. But Alibaba is already a seasoned company like Amazon is now. And for instance, we've seen Amazon collapse all the way back down from, I think it was well above 300 down to almost, what, 200 now. Or so, I think it was my 400, from 400 down to 300. And just ridiculous in that stretch as the, as the growth has really just stalled there. In their latest quarter, they didn't make much money. So I think, Nick, you'd agree, like, you know, I don't think that not only is it a market top signal, just another one. We've seen so many IPOs come to the public, which are obvious market top signals. But is there really an investment here? Well, I mean, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be a hot one. It's going to be a hot IPO. But if it's a flop, and, and most of these IPOs lately have been flops, it's really telling of, of what the overall market is going to do, especially with so much liquidity being brought into the system. Every time there's a new IPO, there's more liquidity. And then there's a secondary offering where companies – go back and they, they issue more shares. So um, we're seeing just tons and tons of liquidity in the system. That always concerns me. And, and I believe, you know, as I said, I think it's going to be the mark of a top. Hmm. So just be aware of that. I think it's coming out by, by mid-June. It will be publicly traded in the markets. And you're going to hear more and more hype. Now, the one thing I would like to throw out there, folks, and this, this is something that I've used in the past to make quite a bit of money, 
Think about it in terms of sympathy plays. So as the hype starts to build on Alibaba going into the IPO, if you can find another Chinese company that's been beaten down, you might see a bounce in that stock. For instance, I mean, Nick, I don't know what you think here, and I'm not saying that the, that these necessarily are buys at this point, but maybe over the next couple of weeks, like a couple of weeks before, but like like a stock like Sina or uh, Sohu, S-O-H-U, um, some of these stocks have really been beaten down. In fact, I'm just looking at this Sohu chart, S-O-H-U right now, and it just looks like it got above the 20 moving average. I mean, is that something that we could maybe look to capitalize? I mean, a good chart plus the hype on Alibaba, maybe a nice uh, Sure, possible? sure. Another way of playing Alibaba, or at least the one way that people have been playing Alibaba has been through Yahoo. Mm -hmm. and, and now you're starting to see Yahoo deteriorate, which is telling me that this Alibaba IPO is overhyped. And uh, you know, I'm, I'm looking for Yahoo to go down to $31. Right now it's trading at 3340 but going back to the Chinese uh, ADRs and Chinese internet stocks, yeah, they're certainly going to probably benefit um, with the Alibaba hype. So um, that would be something to look at. But right now, uh, these these charts still look kind of – I don't know if they're, the, the, the patterns are so terrific yet. But um, as we get and, – and again, Alibaba, we hear rumors that it's going to come out in June – there's talk that it may be in July. There's talk now, uh, I've heard, September. So mm -hmm. I really don't know the set date, and that's that's what makes it a little bit tricky. Yeah, I think you definitely want to find out that set date where it's in stone, where it'll start trading. And then I think you probably see it. And I think the key is here, folks, if you're interested in playing some of these Chinese ADRs, which are these, you know, the Sina, SINAs, SOHUs, and even some of the small caps, uh, if you're a member of InTheMoneyStocks.com and we see the proper setup into that, well, we're going to put it out as a trade alert that we're taking and pass that information right along to you you guys so you'll be able to get on board but i agree that that right now you want to wait till you get that exact date because again who knows when it is i mean they might they might even be delaying it because the ipo market has gotten so weak i mean you've seen so many ipos come out and they haven't really performed i mean just think about candy crush I mean, Candy Crush was a was a basic flop i think it's i don't even know if it's down king is the symbol on that one well, yeah, it's it's farther. It's trading right now at sixteen dollars and twenty five cents, and that was from the first day it went public. It traded above twenty one dollars during the day. So, I mean, that's already a twenty plus percent drop on the stock right there. Grubhub was another one. Yeah. G R U B. I mean, the stock opened up uh, that day, traded above forty dollars. It's sitting at thirty two dollars right now. Mm -hmm. I mean, these are all flops. It's it's they've just flooded the system with so many IPOs. I mean, it's, it's almost virtually every day we have two, three IPOs. Yeah, and, and just remember, folks, is that it's all about, you know, when you see all these flooding the market, that's because those people who are running the companies, they want to cash out. And I always think, I think people don't understand that. But when they're selling it to the public, I mean, think about it. They're trying to cash out some of their, their money in this, the company. And if someone's trying to cash out of their company, do you really want to be stepping up and saying, sure, I'll be, I'll be the, the sucker that buys it? All right, last thing I want to say, Nick, do you have any stocks uh, that our members or our listeners could be uh, looking at this week? I mean, what, what do you think the market's going to do, and what should they be buying? Well, we have a holiday coming up. Um, so this Friday, the market's going to be very, very slow. The Memorial Day weekend is, is just a week away. So, um, you know, you, you could probably look at the volume getting lighter towards the latter part of the week. That's going to favor some uh, equities. But one stock I'm looking at is Whole Foods, ticker symbol WFM. And I really like this one, around $34.00. And fifty cents right now. It's trading at thirty seven ninety one. So we could see a little bit more of a dip in there, and I expect we will. But uh, right around thirty four fifty, thirty four twenty five, I think you could pick up Whole Foods. And do you think uh, the market this week with the holiday coming up is going to be light volume and kind of just choppy sideways? I think um, as we get to Thursday, probably. But Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, we should see pretty good volume out here because uh, there's a lot going on geopolitically. All right. Sounds good, Nick. Thank you for your information today. It's always a pleasure to have Chief Market Strategist Nicholas Santiago with us. My name, Chief Market Strategist Gareth Soloway at InTheMoneyStocks.com. And again, you're listening to In The Money Stock Market Action on 820 AM News Talk Radio. Take care.